church today. I know it's cold and blustery. I'd like to welcome back Lloyd Bradbury. He's not been in a while. It takes a lot of guts to get up when it's cold and blustery and you're driving a rollator and everything else that's in the rollator just to come to church. I think that's pretty remarkable. Uh, I would like everybody to lift up Linda Ned Carney in your prayers. She's on vacation, traveling mercies tomorrow. Our Syrian family is coming in, into the airport, as I understand it. No, no. Thursday. Thursday. Tomorrow we're getting ready. Tomorrow we're cleaning the apartment and moving furniture. And I'm, oh, gee, I'm really sorry I'm missing this. <laughs> This, this wasn't well planned. Just wanted to make everybody aware that I'm gonna be leaving later on today to go home to Sydney to get my house ready to rent. Um, I was in such a gosh darn awful hurry to get to Riverside that I left literally stuff in the middle of the floor. And you can't rent a house with stuff in the middle of the floor. So pray for me that I get there safely and get back safely and I don't hurt my back in between. Are there other announcements? Good morning, Liz. Good morning. Uh, women's Bible study meet this week. Is that Wednesday? Yes. 10.30 a.m.? Yes. Women's Bible study meets this Wednesday at 10.30 a.m. in the upstairs parlor. Prayers for my son, Stephen. And prayers for her son, Stephen, who had a stroke last weekend. Hopefully all is going well there. Any other announcements? Let's worship the Lord. Oh, sorry, Lord. Lloyd, I can't see, guys. <laughs> my glasses are on my head, not on my face. Lloyd, go ahead. You are welcome very much for coming back to the church.
yet if we confess our sin before God, we are healed of it, made aware. We are called to a new thing, cleansed and empowered, healed. Let's pray together. Eternal God, we have gone too far astray. I took my picture to school, 
At lunchtime, I showed my poems to best friend Rose. Look, I drew a rabbit, I said. She looked at the picture, and then she looked at me and said, Emma, that's not God, that's a loaf of bread. Again, I wanted to argue. Rose, this is God, I thought. God is bread. But instead, I decided to go home and draw God on the earth. That night, as I sat down and asked God for some help, please, God, I said, help me draw you. I pleaded. I stared at the blank piece of paper for a while, and then I grabbed a writing clicker. I drew a gigantic heart, and I colored it in so hard that my crayon disappeared. And when I was done, it was the reddest, most beautiful heart I had ever seen. My heart was a thump, thump, thump. I knew, absolutely, positively, I had drawn God, and even Picasso would agree. At lunch, Peter and Rose found me. They asked me if I had drawn any more pictures of God. I brought my backpack, I pulled out a folded piece of paper, and I said, here's another one. Peter opened the paper, and he squawked. That's a drawing of a heart, not God. Rose chimed in, and Emma, that's not a Valentine. And this time, I wanted to jump up and down and scream, God is love. Instead, I took the drawing back, and I tucked it away. As I walked home from school, everything felt heavy. <clears throat> that night, I didn't feel like Picasso. Kneeling next to my bed, I asked God to do some more help. God, please help me to draw you so that my friends can see you. By Friday, it seemed as if everyone in the school knew about my bad habits. Everyone was looking. I was waiting for them to point and laugh. But for the first time, I didn't care what anyone thought about my drawings. I felt a comfort that would not leave my side. I knew why I had drawn God. God knew why I had drawn God. And maybe Picasso knew too. Finally, that felt like enough. But on that following Monday, Something beyond the spectacular happened. Everyone was going to die, and every picture was different. My friends, what does God look like to you? Feel like to you? How would you do? If you're willing to try, I'd love to see your pictures. I'm going to try to draw God this week. I bet every single day he might look and feel different, just like the ones he's been in the book. Because while God is always with us and always around us, we feel him and we see him in different ways. And that is the beauty of having a relationship with God. So let's pray. Heavenly Father, let us remember that each of us sees you and feels you in different ways. But while we all see and feel different ways, we all take up for the feeling that you are there for us today and each day. Amen. Please join me in the unison prayer for illumination that you'll find in your bulletin. Let us pray. Gracious God, you are the majesty, the light, and the hope of the universe. Infuse us with your wisdom, energy, presence, and love, so that we may obey your call to rebuild the world, one person, one animal, one field, one forest, one mountain, one beach, and one river at a time. We have a sin and fruit of Christ Jesus. Amen. This morning we read about Joseph 
And we know that Joseph was, seemed to have been the favorite of his father, Jacob. He had the coat of many colors. He had dreams that where uh, the dream always placed him above his brothers. And his brothers became angry with him and jealous. And some of them wanted to kill him, but finally he was sold into slavery in Egypt. And when he was in Egypt, his ability to interpret dreams uh, placed him in Pharaoh's service because Pharaoh had dreams that prognosticated that there would be famine in the country after, for seven years after seven years of plenty. And so the, the Pharaoh put Joseph in charge of all of the powers of the throne of Egypt so that he could gather the crops when there was plenty and he could meet out the crops when there was need. Joseph's brothers came down looking for food during that time of need, and at first Joseph didn't reveal himself to them, but here is where he reveals himself to them. A reading from Genesis 45, verses 3 to 11. Joseph said to his brothers, I am Joseph. Is my father still alive? But his brothers could not answer him, so dismayed were they at his presence. Then Joseph said to his brothers, Come closer to me. And they came closer. He said, I am your brother Joseph, whom you sold into Egypt. And now do not be distressed or angry with yourselves, because you sold me here. For God sent me before you to preserve life. For the famine has been in the land these two years, and there are five more years in which there will be neither plowing nor harvest. God sent me before you to preserve for you a remnant on earth, and to keep alive for you many survivors. So it was not you who sent me here, but God. He has made me a father to Pharaoh, and lord of all his house, and ruler over all the land of Egypt. Hurry and go up to my father and say to him, Thus says your son Joseph, God has made me lord of all Egypt. Come down to me, do not delay. You shall settle in the land of Goshen, and you shall be near me, you and your children and your children's children, as well as your flocks, your herds, and all that you have. I will provide for you there, since there are five more years of famine to come so that you and your household and all that you have will not come to poverty. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. God.
Our second lesson comes from Luke's Gospel, chapter 6, verses 27 through 38. Listen once again for the word of the Lord. Jesus said, But I say to you that listen, love your enemies. Do good to those who hate you. Bless those who curse you. Pray for those who abuse you. If anyone strikes you on the cheek, offer the other also. And from anyone who takes away your coat, do not withhold even your shirt. Give to everyone who begs from you. And if anyone takes away your goods, do not ask for them again. Do to others as you would have them do to you. If you love those who love you, what credit is that to you? For even sinners love those who love them. If you do good to those who do good to you, what credit is that to you? For even sinners do the same. If you lend to those from whom you hope to receive, what credit is that to you? Even sinners lend to sinners to receive as much again. But love your enemies, do good, and lend, expecting nothing in return. Your reward will be great, and you will be children of the Most High, for he is kind to the ungrateful and the wicked. Be merciful, just as your Father is merciful. Do not judge, and do not be judged. Do not condemn, and you will not be condemned. Forgive, and you will be forgiven. Give, and it will be given to you. A good measure, pressed down, shaken together, running over, will be put into your lap. For the measure you give will be the measure you get back. The word of the Lord. Like I said last week, sometimes, depending on where you stand, the good news doesn't sound like good news. <laughs> One of the tensions that we all labor under, from childhood to adulthood, is managing the tension between the task of discerning God, seeing God, seeing God for ourselves, the book was a beautiful book, and it brought me to a whole different place in the beginning of the week than I ended in, than I ended the week. But I'm thankful for the journey in between. I learned a lot. One of the challenges of interim time is to get everybody to articulate their vision of God. How many of y'all see God as light? Light. That big, yellow, hot, warm sun that causes everything to grow. I think that's a fair metaphor. God is light. How many of y'all see God in bright red crayon? Heart. How many of y'all can see both? How many of y'all see God a different way? Yeah, exactly. So we start out on the yoga mat of life. We learn to crawl. We learn to see. We learn to name things. And then somewhere around young adulthood, parenthood, we start seeing things a different way. And somehow, again, in middle age, to senior adulthood, we start seeing things a whole different way. Luke's Jesus is calling us to heroics, lavish kindness, lavish gentleness, lavish, lavish peaceability and humbleness, lavish joy in Jesus Christ. Be fearless, be willing to endure difficulty, delight in serving others. I have a face mask that says Bah humbug. <laughs> Heroic is about being what's over and above what we can believe ourselves to be capable of. So while some of us see God as hearts and some of us see God as sun and some of us see God in completely other ways, the task of interim time is to see it both as an individual and as a task where individuals are ignited, ignited and united in a common purpose, in a common community called the True Kirk. We are here to excavate God in ourselves, to locate God in each other, 
and to magnify God together. Now, some of you might not even have been a gleam in your mother and father's eye in 1967. I came almost at the very end, December 29th. But some of you have full recollections of that year. I'm going to remind you of a few things about 1967. And this information comes from the online resource Wikipedia. And if you use it, you should support it. Did you know that on January, do you remember that on January the 2nd, 1967, Ronald Reagan, the past movie actor and future president of the United States, was inaugurated as the new governor of California? Jim Morrison and The Doors, self-titled debut, The Doors album came out. The Vietnam War, the United States Marine Corps, and the Army of the Republic of the Vietnam troops launched Operation Deck House 5 in the Mekong Delta. Or more fun, the Super Bowl, first Super Bowl ever between Green Bay Packers and the Kansas City Chiefs. Chiefs 35-10 at the Los Angeles Memorial Coliseum. The Packers beat the Chiefs. I'm not going to go through the whole year. I can't. Though it was very illuminating, and I took lots of rabbit hole trips this week. I learned a lot about American history that I really didn't know. In May, May the 2nd, armed members of the Black Panther Party entered the California State Capitol to protest a bill that restricted the carrying of arms in public. Do you know that? I didn't know that either. We've been arguing about that a long time. But if they went to the California State House as Black Panthers, hmm, wonder how that turned out. In June of that year, Loving versus Virginia, the United States Supreme Court declares that all U.S. state laws prohibiting interracial marriage to be unconstitutional. And June 13th, Solicitor General Thurgood Marshall is nominated as the first African-American justice of the United States Supreme Court. The end of that month, famous actress Jane Mansfield and two other people are killed in a car crash in, near Slidell, Louisiana. Mansfield's daughter, Mariska Hargitay, Hargitay, is asleep in the back seat and she crashes of the time of the crash and she survives. You guys know her. How many of y'all love her too, right? August that year, Thurgood Marshall is confirmed as the first African-American justice of the Supreme Court. And in September, September 11th, 1967, the Carol Burnett Show premiered on CBS and it runs for 11 seasons until March 1978. Maybe that will help balance our memories of September 11th. In October of that year, United States Navy pilot John McCain was shot down over North Vietnam and he was made a POW. His capture was announced in the New York Times and the Washington Post two days later. In December, child physician and psychiatrist, psychologist Dr. Benjamin Spock and the poet Allen Ginsberg were both arrested for protesting against the Vietnam War in New York City. And today, the Magical Mystery Tour, the Beatles. The Magical Mystery Tour was released as 11 song album in U.S. songs added to the original six on a double EP that included All You Need Is Love, Penny Lane, Strawberry Fields Forever, Baby You're a Rich Man, and Hello Goodbye. How many of y'all know Baby You're a Rich Man? Never heard of it, ever. <laughs> exactly, under a rock. <laughs> uh, more research, right? Absolutely. But the one that hit me most to the core was on December 10th, soul singer Otis Redding, who was 26, is killed when the airplane he's on crashes into Lake Monona. The crash also claims the life of all his five-member band, and the only survivor is fellow musician Ben Hawley. Now, I don't know when these things happen, but ongoing things like the Cold War, the space race, the Vietnam War, all those things we kind of vaguely remember, but I know nobody knows that the Big Mac was introduced in Pittsburgh in 1967, right? 
Big Mac and cheese? Big Mac, no cheese. <laughs> anyway. I wasn't a flower child, but I was a daughter to two hippies, so it sort of sunk in. My friend, the, the tank driver, Paul Reed, called my dad the hare. Jesus is saying, we need love. Not just a little bit of love, not just love when it suits us, but radical, change me, change you, change everybody love. And every, like I did last Sunday, the church is going yada, 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 because it's all about business as usual, keeping the lights on, the bills, putting the butts in the pews, and everybody happy enough of the time so that the pastor gets hired back next year. I don't think Jesus thought about any of that. I know it sounds naive to say all you need is love. But do you suppose it was love that took Jesus to the cross? That kept him from running away? Or do you suppose it was about principle and being a man and, and understanding that if you give up, you throw in the towel, you run away? That everything you thought you stood for, everything that you have previously supported, if you run away, all of that goes away with you. I think a lot about why church. And part of it is nice people. I called a pastor that I went to school with who used to be a youth pastor, and I said, Bill, when we went to seminary, we thought this was going to be fun. Yeah, we did. And to his credit, he said, but I think I've had more fun than you. With kids, I get to play with water pistols and water balloons and go on mission trips and do stuff. I'm like, don't rub it in. All you need is love. All you need is love. Why do we keep doing this? Because we love Jesus, and we know Jesus is going to turn everything right. Yeah, well, somebody told me this week that our faith isn't about magic. So how is Jesus going to turn this right? And he let out his long sigh. You know, it's that already thing that Jesus did, that whole resurrection thing, that already not yet, that the whole world is waiting for. I said, I'm tired of waiting. I'm just plain old tired. He said, I know you always call me when you're tired. And I said, well, okay, what's going on with you? He goes, I got prostate problems. <laughs> I started laughing. <laughs> I said, the middle age creep is getting us all. Bill, you're unhappy. He's got his first ever two point grown up charge. And he's miserable. I said, why are we still doing this? Because we love Jesus. And we're too stubborn to quit. I said, well, what happens if we're doing more harm than good? He said, you think too much. So I'm gonna look at the book of Genesis, because it's not about superheroes, although you could say that Joseph is a biblical superhero. What kind of love is represented in the book of Genesis? Parent, child love. Joseph is the son of Jacob, Rachel, and his first question to his brothers is, is dad still living? How many of y'all have parents that are no longer physically with us? If you look inside your mind and your memory book of your heart, how many of your parents are still living with you? Every day, every day they determine how you love because they were the first people to show you some. Not perfect, but good enough in most of our cases. Love in Genesis isn't perfect, but it is very good enough. Sibling love, sibling rivalry is also love, believe it or not, it's just love sideways. Right, right? They were tired of daddy playing favorites and they were tired of the most immature of little brothers lording it over them. We've all got somebody in our community like that. I can do it better than you can. I saw it first, it's mine. Every community has that dynamic because we're all brothers and sisters. But don't be angry or distressed with yourselves, says Joseph. I will provide for you there in Goshen. That's an amazing thing. 
They try to kill him, they sell him into slavery. He goes through a really hard time with not only his servitude, but his, his life of sexual abuse with Potiphar's wife. He runs away, gets thrown in jail, and he still says God meant all that for good. And that introduces some theology problems for a preacher. I'm not going to tell you that bad things happen and God always uses them for good. I think sometimes bad stuff just happens. But if we give God the chance, each time something happens, God will turn it just a little bit, 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 a little bit. So that finally, after a long series of little bits, we're back in the path of alignment again. Because God's got time. And God's got love. And will, love always has a will. A will to love, a will to be, a will to become, a will to hope, a will to do, a will to not give up. So we have parent and child love, we have sibling love and sibling rivalry, we have jealousy and rage and bad behavior, and I call it, this got me in trouble in seminary, but I'm gonna repeat it. Joseph goes from fave to slave, from cistern to caravan, or even baptism to crucifixion. All of that. And if it was good enough for Joseph, and it was good enough for Jesus, guess what, friends? It's good enough for the church. So we get all down when things get hard, but I want to say, kind of sideways, when things are hard, God is on the move. So we have sibling love and rivalry, we have jealousy and rage and bad behavior and vengeance, getting back, getting, even picking up your marbles or going home. Whatever it is we have, we have it. It's ours. Let's keep working the system. Love in Genesis is also about grandparental love. Verse 10, you shall be near me, you and your children and your grandchildren. How many of y'all make decisions on a daily basis with your grandchildren and great-grandchildren foremost in your minds? Remember that really tall naval aviator that I used to argue with on the beach? He'd call me a tree hugger. And I call him an Earth Destroyer. He really was an Earth Destroyer. He was an alternate for the Enola Gay mission. Right? I said to him once, I said, Cappy, you say you love me, but you really don't love me because you gaslight me and you tell me that you can do all these things and then not care about what the Earth is like for me and JW when he grows up. You guys are smart. You'll figure it out. Talk about gaslighting, man. You guys are smart, you'll figure it out. How many of y'all session members are tired of trying to be smart and figure it out? Lord God, hear us as we pray. Home, homeland, kind of love. That homeland, home kind of love is dangerous. It's both sentimental, but it's also nationalistic. Whether it's from Canaan or Goshen or Germany or United States or Ukraine and Russia, this love gets sideways easy. But just so you know, we're still fighting about the same places. The famine was horrible, and they ran away to the Nile Delta, because there was water there. These immigration things that we're fighting about, if we don't get our ducks lined up, it's gonna get a whole lot worse before it gets a whole lot better. Love in Genesis is about the divine. God loves, God plans, God redeems, and God provides so that they do not come to poverty. If we were putting God and our grandchildren in the forefront of everything that we think and do so that the world does not come to poverty because we have that power, God gave us that power. In this section, we see little boy Joseph all grown up. Little brother is all grown up. How many of y'all hated your kid brother or kid sister when you were young? My little sister was six years younger than me. And boy, can I tell you, she was a buzzing brat. She used to run to the front door every day when dad would come home from work. Six, ten, on the dot. She'd run to the front door, pull open the front door, and yell, Dad, why'd you bring me? My brother and I didn't think too highly of that. However, little 
brother Joseph is all grown up and he recognizes his own part in the trouble. The bottom line is my brother and I were children of another marriage and we were a little jealous of our twin sister. We didn't think it was safe in mom and my step, my dad and my stepmom's house to run to the front door, all three of us, and say, what'd you bring us? It just wasn't quite like that, right? But little brother's all grown up. He recognizes his own part in the trouble with his brothers and his sisters. He's secure in himself, and because he's secure in himself and because he recognizes his own part, he's free to take a different route. If somebody threw me and a sister and sold me into slavery and I ended up in jail in Egypt and then in Pharaoh's service, I'd be wanting to settle a score. Make no bones about it. I imagine most of you would too. But because he's okay, because he understands, and because he has a faith in God that some of us may or may not share, because this is complicated, did God really mean all that bad for good? Or did God make it so? So that Joseph could learn a new way of being. And in Joseph, all the rest of us. He recognizes his own part of the trouble, he secured himself, and he changes the dynamic of competition and cruelty to a dynamic of care. Church, that is our job. And we learn it here together. We're supposed to learn it at home, but I don't know about you, I just admitted that I didn't learn any, everything I needed to learn at home at all. Did y'all learn everything you needed to learn at home at home? Did you learn it when you got married and maybe divorced the first time? <laughs> That's me, right? I started learning really for real then because I don't like leaving mayhem and misery in my wake. But God gives us the opportunity to change our dynamics and to change our understanding and to change our competition and our cruelty into care. And here is the song that started all of this this week. I read the Genesis chapter and I read the Luke chapter. And the song just popped into my brain. How many of y'all know it? Do you know what? All you need is love. My son says all the time, my church is boring. Why don't you play some good music? I'm like, oh. <laughs> Like, I think your idea of good music is skinny. So I would invite you, as Sarah plays it, look at it, sing it, enjoy it, let it in you, let it be in you, let it come out of you. No judgment about how it sounds. But really all we do need is love. Because if it's right here, front and center, it changes the way we see ourselves. And I saw myself as really ugly this week a couple of times. But also, really trying hard to be faithful, and really sometimes actually getting it right. Right? So it's all in God's hands. And because God loves us, all we need is love. You play it? Thank <laughs> you. 
So that one's for my son who's in the United Arab Emirates. He loves the Beatles, I have no idea why. <laughs> he didn't hear it in my house growing up. But just to say that I try to do my homework about where I'm living. I learned about the Chicago 7 this week and a guy named Abby Hoffman, which I never heard of before. But to close the idea, part of why All You Need Is Love is important is it was the first ever international, all the world satellite broadcast. And that's why this song was so simple and clear and direct. It was meant for the whole world to hear. On December 10th, 1971, John Lennon said, okay, so flower power didn't work. So what? We start again. I think that's a really great message. Pastors come, pastors go, but we start again. Each time. Because without love, without each other, without light, without bread, without Valentine's, what do we have? Here is reading the word of the Lord. Friends, let us pray together. Eternal Father, we thank you that throughout these long years, these conflicted years, you have remained in love with us. We give you thanks that you give us as many chances as it takes for the lights to go on, the hearts to open, the hands to reach out, the feet to march. We give you thanks for all the love that our family pours into us. We give you thanks for the things that our society gives us. Education, civil liberties, strategic safety. Holy God, we ask you to help us do our part in peace, in holiness, and in love. Lord God, Pastor's been quiet about the COVID stuff, but so many have perished, often needlessly. Lord, help us to get our ducks in a row. Help us to love each other better. Help us to understand more and judge less. Because the truth is, both sides are right, and both sides pay. Lord God, pull us out of this cistern of darkness. Pull us out of the slavery of our own making. Pull us out of our judginess. The difference between judgment and judgmentalism, Lord. You call us to be wise and discerning, but not judgy. We lift up all who are ill, we lift up all who are grieving, we lift up all who are physically infirm, we lift up all who are doing their level best to serve, even when they don't feel like they are appreciated. Lord, help us reach out to each other to reconcile that which is broken, and to move ahead. Superheroes in Jesus' line, because we go not only beyond ourselves, but we invite things back into ourselves. We need love too, God. It's not just for us to give it, it's for us to receive it, even when it doesn't feel comfortable. Finally, Lord, we thank you for teaching us your prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Friends, freely we have received God's gifts, God's blessing. Let us freely return a prayer for God's use.
show up. Because we show up, we're expecting you to do amazing things among us. And through us, live with us. We ask you to take these gifts and take us and use it all to reach your own purpose. This we ask you, Christ. Amen. Our closing hymn should sound familiar to all of you. It's number 339.